Anyways, uh, so this will be pediatric behavior. There are also three other pediatric lectures. This is just about behavioral issues, um, and it won't be talking about other pediatric conditions um, and things that are associated with behaviors we put into here. Uh, we've got 30 minutes to get through this, so let's get started. We're going to start with uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and autism spectrum disorder. So they're both disorders and they're both spectrums. With fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, it's an umbrella term. It covers three different major things. One is the fetal alcohol syndrome, which I think we're familiar with. And then the other one is the neurobehavioral stuff. And the difference between that one and fetal alcohol syndrome is they don't have the facial features, okay? So the behavioral stuff is there, but not the facial features. And then the final thing is just alcohol-related uh, defects. So let's start with the fetal alcohol syndrome and then move on to the behavioral stuff and then we'll talk about just the birth defects. And the birth defects is none of the facial stuff, none of the behavioral stuff, just birth defects due to alcohol. And so what's the cause of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? That's right, alcohol. It's a 100% preventable condition. And what's the safe amount to take for a pregnant woman? Yeah, a nice round number. Since we don't know, right, we don't know if there's a safe level, we stick to that nice round, lump, round number of zero. And it is associated, it's dose dependent. And a lot of the um, facial stuff happens early in the first trimester. And then the other stuff can happen any time during the pregnancy. So fetal alcohol syndrome under the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, for diagnosing it, it takes two out of the three facial features and then the behavioral, and then the growth retardation. So those are the three things. And under the facial features, um, they have short palpebral fissures, so around the eyes. They've got that thin vermilion border for the upper lip, so they've got that thin lip. And then the philtrum, that little angel spot right here on kids, right, it's very flat. So they have to have two out of those three to get into that diagnosis, and that behavioral stuff, and the growth stuff. Other possible features, there's different things that you can get a flat mid-face, the epicanthial folds, uh, campylodactyly, uh, clinodactyly, we'll go through that as well. Railroad track ears and hockey stick palm creases. Hmm. All right, so if you want, um, you can look at your own hand and see if you've got a hockey stick. If you're Canadian, you will have the crease. I looked at mine before this lecture, I'm like, oh my God. I'm gonna have to talk to mom, but look at that. I think I've, anyways, um, but, but that's not one of the major features, right? If you um, don't want to look at yourself, turn to your neighbor and look at their ear and see if they've got a railroad track ear. This is an interactive course, right? And then that, that uh, fifth digit that sort of bends in is the clinodactyly or clinodactyly, yep. Yeah. All right, um, so it requires the facial findings. Two out of the three, palpebral fissures, epicanthial folds, vermilion border, that philtrum that's flat there, a growth defect, and then some kind of central nervous system disorder, and it's usually behavioral, um, but learning disabilities, memory disabilities, attention span, all of those things can come into that to meet the definition of fetal alcohol syndrome. The neurobehavioral stuff is just the behavioral stuff without the facial features, okay? Um, and then birth defects, you can have any of those organs can be affected by alcohol uh, during uh, pregnancy, but they don't have the facial features or the behavioral features. So what do you do to treat it? Well, it's preventable, so that's the treatment. But once somebody has it, that's the condition for life. And so um, it's managing it with um, uh, various structures for behavior, therapies uh, for them. Uh, but prevention is really the only um, definitive treatment to prevent that. All right, so for autism spectrum disorder, and we've already covered that this is not related to vaccines, but this is the question with regards to autism spectrum disorder. You have to have two findings. Um, one of them is reciprocal communication, so they don't seem to connect, right, with the outside world very well. What's the other one? Is it aggressive behavior, repetitive patterns of behavior, repetitive patterns of behavior, repetitive patterns of behavior? I'm on the spectrum, people. Um, poor weight gain after five or symptoms. So what's the answer? B, all right, yes. All right, so for the DSM-5 diagnostic uh, things, that persistent repetitive behavior and that difficulty with social interactions. 
need to have that. It presents early in life. You don't develop later in life. Um, we think it has a genetic influence uh, to that, but nobody knows for sure what the cause is. So they have delayed language development is one of the most common presentations, and it's usually present before the second year of life. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends screening between 18 and 24 months. And there are some various checklists there. The uh, task force gives it an eye recommendation just because they, don't have, they have insufficient data. I don't know. They don't know what to do with regards to the recommendation. So this is an eye recommendation with regards to screening from the task force, whereas the American Academy of Pediatrics says yes. So the spectrum disorder for autism, it can range from you just need a little support because it is a spectrum to really needing a lot of support. And certainly there is studies that show that early intervention with um, significant amount of structure and modifying behavior can be helpful. And we want to try to avoid pharmacological answers if possible because with those drugs come side effects as well. But sometimes it's necessary, especially for um, behavioral stuff that can turn violent and stuff like that. Social communication disorder is separate from autism spectrum disorder, and certainly autism spectrum disorder, that communication component is part of the diagnostic criteria, but they can just have isolated social communication disorder. So if you have autism spectrum disorder, you do have this, but if you have this, you don't necessarily have autism. Okay, just to make sure that's clear. And it's multidisciplinary treatment. Attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder, Okay, you've seen it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, for the DSM-5, six or more components, um, and it shows up before the age of 17, and it has to be persistent, so it's not some stage that a child's going through. It's their inherent cruise control. So while some people's cruise control is set at the double nickel going 55, these kids have a cruise control set at 75. They're just go, go, go. If they fall into the hyperactive, because there's the hyperactive and there's the inattentive, and then there's a combination of both. Those are the three main patterns that you'll see. And the diagnosis is clinical. You ask the mom or you ask the teacher. And it's usually boys, right? It's a, a male predominant, and so they're tearing up the classroom. You know this when you walk into the room. Haven't you walked into the examining room and it's like Johnny's like, you know, and getting out the tongue depressors, pulling things off the wall, and it's like, yeah, I think I've made my diagnosis right? It's usually the end of bed diagnosis, but certainly it is clinical. There's no serum marker for this. Uh, there are the three subtypes, like I said. There's the inattentive, squirrel. Um, there's the hyperactive, the go, go, go. And then there's the combination between the two. The AAP uh, does recommend for screening between the ages of four uh, years of age and 18 years of age. And the treatment, um, in the preschool, we really try to do behavioral modification and structure as opposed to chemically uh, addressing this, um, but sometimes that is needed. Uh, but certainly, if you have uh, a child truly with ADHD, the medication is highly effective. If it's not highly effective, you should really back off and go, maybe they don't have ADHD, because you will see significant improvement, especially once they get into school age, uh, the chance for them to be able to sit down and focus and actually interact is uh, quite significant. Um, it's, we give them stimulants, right? I mean, this is where the fidget spinners come in and stuff like that. They're always constantly going, and so to stimulate them, right, calms them down and relaxes them and allows them to focus. Um, so uh, once they get into school age, you're looking at the um, phenylphenidate uh, preparations, and you can get into the patches, the long-acting ones, we have less evidence for things like Stratera and Clonidine and stuff like that, but if you have the child with the right diagnosis, this medication can really make a difference to their um, self-esteem and their ability to function within that classroom setting. So uh, there are the uh, medications with regards to psychostimulant. There is some concern though if, you, uh, if you're giving a stimulant and if there's a family history of cardiac disease, that's always a concern. And so um, doing a focused history followed by a directed physical exam is the way you address that. And no ECG or cardiac consult unless they have a history or clinical evidence of a cardiac issue, then these drugs are considered reasonable to start. 
learning disabilities. Okay, so that's the autism spectrum disorder. We've uh, looked at the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. This is about learning disabilities. And the etiology, it can be congenital, so people can be born with their learning disabilities, or they can acquire it from various reasons. And there's a list of things. Everything from illness, you can have an, a learning disability if you've missed a lot of school. It can be behavioral. If you live in certain areas where they have lead in the water, that can be a problem, right? And so environmental poor nutrition, and then there's all these socioeconomic and social determinants of health that can lead to learning disabilities in children. There is associations with other conditions like ADHD and impaired social skills. Um, the differential diagnosis when you're dealing with somebody with a learning disability is trying to navigate through that with the parent, maybe with the teacher, and through direct observation and trying to figure out were they always like this or is this something new that's developed for some reason. Um, the treatment is trying to identify those children at an early stage because treatment can be helpful for those individuals. And it's usually uh, individualized because learning disabilities is a huge umbrella. And you usually need some help with that, some team members that can give you some support in managing that patient. Certainly chronic illness can lead to learning disabilities. And I mentioned that if you're missing a lot of school, um, if you have uh, you know, cystic fibrosis, and you know, you're missing a lot of school because of respiratory illnesses and stuff like that, you're obviously going to suffer academically and stuff like that if you have visual impairments, hearing impairments, those types of things. Now moving on to emotional and behavioral problems. Um, it's a bit of a diagnostic dilemma. Um, I've got at least one child out of the teenage years, but at one point I had three teenagers living in the house. And, and so there's that thing of like, is it just you're a teenager? or is it, you know, a stage you're going through, or is this some kind of actual behavioral issue that's medicalized as opposed to just a stage in life? And sometimes that's hard to figure out. Um, we're gonna go through three of the common ones. One's the oppositional defiant disorder, then we have the conduct disorder, and then depression. So oppositional defiant disorder, or ODD, that's that, ne they're in your face. This is oppositional. They're right up. They're dent in the bubble. They're, they're, they're like getting right up in you and directly oppositional. And that's different than the other condition. Okay? It's usually aggressive, but it has to persist for a certain length of time. It can't just be they're pissed off and they're going through something at school or there's some boyfriend, girlfriend stuff going on, something. It has to be a longer pattern for to make that diagnosis. Um, frequently angry, vindictive. Um, and here's the distinction between normal behavior. It occurs most days, right? It's present there for months and months, and it's present for most days. Um, uh, they say, you know, one setting, but it's usually most settings. Um, and you need help with these people. You need to help with regards to mental health and getting those other professionals in there to help with those people. Um, also, medications can play a role because there is a concern um, with regards to the aggressive behavior. Conduct disorder is different though, okay? So the oppositional defiant disorder, that's in your face. They're in your personal space, right? But the conduct disorder, they're a bit sneaky. It's behind the scenes a bit. It's, you know, not, uh, you know, going with social norms. It certainly can have aggression and stuff like that, but it's usually sort of trickier, deceitful, that kind of stuff. Um, and then major depression. And I think we're more familiar with those than the oppositional defiant disorder. Um, the prevalence is 2%, but it seems to be rising, at least in my clinical experience. Uh, certainly suicide is a big issue. Uh, and um, there are risk factors for that, things that are associated with that suicidality and risk of having a major depressive episode in the teenage years. You may be familiar with this screening tool, but it is a screening tool. So if you apply a screening tool, the screening tool means if it's positive, doesn't mean they have depression. It means they've screened positive for that condition and you need to do a full, thorough psychological evaluation with regards to making that diagnosis. If they screen negative, you can move on. And so the uh, task force recommends screening uh, pre-teenage up until 18 for depression. And a positive screen, like I said, requires a further, more in-depth evaluation. How long has this been going on? What's your degree of impairment? Are there vegetative signs? Is there substance abuse that's a, a co-illness with this? 
So what are you going to do with a child with depressive uh, symptoms that you've diagnosed with depression? Is it psychotherapy, low-dose SSRI, moderate-dose SSRI, or a moderate-dose SNRI? What's the first line? Psychotherapy, thank you, yes, psychotherapy. And the AAP endorses that. For mild to moderate depression, you should be doing psychotherapy, behavioral stuff, cognitive behavioral therapy. I know mindfulness is sort of coming into this, but it's not reach for the prescription pad um, first off. And certainly there are warnings because we, you can have uh, these teenage and um, early 20s that are depressed and dysthymic and low and stuff like that, and you give them an SSRI, and all of a sudden now they have the motivation to actually go out and commit suicide. And so there is those black box warnings for teenagers with regards to depression and suicidality. So the uh, treatment guidelines after symptom resolution, um, just follow them every six to 12 months and um, uh, they may need to be retreated. That's okay. Which of the following is consistent with night terrors? Okay, yes, again, this is why they gave me this. I had night terrors growing up. Is the child easily rousable? They have no memory of the event occurs during REM sleep or occurs more frequently in females? What's the answer? B, uh, it's almost always the answer, right? B, uh, no memory of the event. I would wake up screaming, just blah, in the middle of the night, my poor mother. Um, you know, just screaming, and you cannot s console the child. It's almost like intestinal colic, right? Where you can't console the child. I would have no memory in the morning of ever having that event, right? It does not play take place during REM sleep, and it's more frequent in males than females, and you can't wake the child up. So there's the diagnosis. Um, there's the age range for it. Um, it certainly can come out in times of stress or fatigue. Um, it's non-REM sleep when these things happen, and there might be a uh, parental history of night terrors. And there's breaking it down from nightmares to night terrors. Very common to have nightmares and children and stuff like that take place during REM sleep, and you can wake the child up and console the child. You can rouse the child, and the child will remember that the next day not with night terrors. All right, so the treatment is just reassurance. This too shall pass. They should outgrow it. Um, it's self-limiting. Uh, can, can, you can consider sleep studies if there's some other things going on and an EEG if you're worried that these are seizures that are happening. But usually it's this too shall pass. What is the normal amount to sleep for a child? There's a list. I, I mean, you think that, you know, babies sleep a lot, yeah, okay, but then you think it's the teenagers that sleep and, you know, get up at the crack of noon. Actually, teenagers don't sleep more. They sleep less than babies. It's just they stay up till two o'clock in the morning on their phone, okay, and so that's why they're tired and don't get up early in the morning. They still need that six, eight, ten hours of sleep, but it's not the 12, 14 hour sleep that we see in the younger age group. Sleepwalking and sleep talking, had both of those. My mom, if she wasn't in my room trying to console me as I woke up with a night terror, she was wondering where she would find me in the morning. Often it was downstairs in a closet somewhere. Sometimes she would have conversations with me in the night. I had no idea that this was going on, but I would talk in my sleep and I would walk in my sleep and they wouldn't know where to find me in the morning. And this is a common thing, that, um, sorry, more common in young males. Um, so uh, I, it can run in families, so one of my three children would suffer from this. We could have conversations, eyes open, talking to you, and then boom, fall back asleep, have no memory of the event. It is, a, oh sorry, did I miss something? Yeah, it's associated with bedwetting as well. Um, treatment, um, you try to keep it to a minimum, but you know, like some of the safety stuff they talk about is, you know, like the window should be closed if the bedroom's on the second floor. Yeah, it makes sense, and if the bedroom can be put on the first floor, well, some people's living arrangements won't be amenable to that. They don't live in a ranch house, or they live in an apartment, and things like that. But you try to change it so it's a safe space, so they're not falling down the stairs, and you've got baby gates up, and things like that. There is the suggestion that you can wake them up 15 minutes before sleepwalking by their history, so if they have this regular schedule that they tend to get up and sleepwalk, that you could wake them up 15 minutes in advance. I'm not so sure about that. All right, which is uh, true about bedwetting? Again, hi, my name is Ken, and I was a bedwetter. Going to summer camp was very painful for me, <laughs> and the sleeping bag was usually wet and came home smelling like urine. Um, so uh, bedwetting, uh, are, it says, A, bedwetting alarms are not effective in the treatment of bedwetting. 
Nocturnal enuresis occurs during non-REM sleep, or is it REM sleep? Secondary enuresis is likely to have, is less likely to have a primary cause than primary enuresis, or pathological cause, sorry, and secondary enuresis is more common than primary. And we know D is wrong, because primary is primary, it's more common. What's the answer? What's the answer? B. All right. So um, this is the official term. It's monosynaptic noc uh, nocturnal enuresis or bedwetting. And it's where you're never consistently dry through the night. Uh, more common and less likely to have a pathological condition. This too shall pass, you outgrow it. And when I was coming up to do this lecture, I was telling Mark that I was doing this lecture in the back and he goes, so you still bedwetting, Ken? I said, thanks, Mark, thanks. Real confidence booster before I get on the stage. Um, and then secondary, um, bedwetting after six months of dryness. So if, if you're not wetting the bed through the night and it's been going six months now, you've been dry, and then you start bedwetting again, you shouldn't be thinking primary, you should be thinking a secondary cause. Maybe it's a UTI, maybe it's a small bladder, maybe something else is going on. Children greater than five regularly have incontinence uh, urine at night, so this was you know, reassuring to me that I was not alone. Um, spontaneous resolution of about 15% a year, so people outgrow it. Um, by age 15, only 1% to 2% still bed wet. I think I was done by about 12 or 13. Obtaining a history and doing a physical exam, sure. Um, urinalysis only if you're suspecting that it's a UTI infectious related. Uh, more prominent in males, positive family history, and occurs during non-REM sleep. It's not that they're having a nightmare and peeing the bed, right? It's during non-REM sleep that this happens. All right, uh, behavioral interventions, they have limited effect. Um, we don't want to restrict fluid at night. I remember growing up and it's like, don't drink anything after dinner, you know, because your bladder will be full and you'll wet the bed. Actually, that's not the case. And you should drink as, if you're thirsty, drink. That's the um, thing, and age-appropriate cleanup. It's hard to tell a five-year-old that they're responsible for bedwetting when it's a natural condition for that child and a certain number of children will have that and sort of be, um, angry and uh, uh, at that child and getting them to clean it up and stuff like that. Reward charts, mm, managing constipation, and certainly avoid retention control, uh, holding your bladder as long as possible. Bed wetting alarms have limited um, use, but some. Some use with bed wetting alarms, and uh, you continue the treatment until they're 14 day dry or two weeks. Uh, there are drugs for this, um, sometimes uh, they can be used, but that desmopressin, it's, it's gotten a, a, a flag recently from the FDA um, because uh, using desmopressin or DDAVP can cause hyponatremia. And if, a child gets if somebody gets hyponatremic, what can happen? Yeah, you drop below 120, you get down in the one teens, 110, seizure, right? I'd rather have a wet bed than a seizing child. And if the child seizes, the bed might be wet anyways, right? And so we're not um, recommending that as much anymore. And then there's some other stuff, uh, if not successful. Which statement is correct regarding developmental stuttering? Begins before the age of three in most children, usually persists into adulthood, can be managed by an SSRI, or often has a genetic or familiar component. Okay, so uh, prevalence uh, usually under the age of 10, but the onset is between three and eight, so not less than three. It's not, yeah, I mean, a two-year-old boy, it's truck, ball, and mine, right? So it's hard to have a, you know, stuttering through that. 80% um, of adults uh, who stutter are men. Uh, classification, it can be developmental, so most common form. Neurologic or psychogenic is rare. So genetics is thought to play a role, and so the answer was D. Um, uh, management, non-pharmacological, so SSRI, who's ever given an SSRI for a stutterer? So that, we knew that answer was wrong, right? And so non-pharmacological and spontaneous recovery uh, within four years of onset in 80% of children. All right, now we're gonna go on to uh, abuse and neglect. Abuse is when you injure a child deliberately, you know, you're abusing the child, and then neglect is where you're not providing them with the, with the ability to thrive and grow and, and be healthy. So, uh, you know, sort of Maslow's theory of needs, right? Food and shelter and stuff like that for neglect. Who do you think um, 
more children die of abuse or neglect? It's neglect. All right, so um, there are associations with abuse and neglect, lower socioeconomic status, special needs children. That can be very taxing on patients. Caregivers who were abused, there can be a cycle of abuse and that they abuse the children. Um, and then alcohol abuse. Which of the following is the most concerning or possible physical abuse? Which would raise your sort of spidey senses? Is it a spiral fracture in a seven-year-old boy who was skiing? A tibial fracture in a six-month-old who fell off the bed? Multiple cuts and bruises and shins in a five-year-old? Or a skull fracture in a 10-year-old who is skateboarding? Which one is it? B, oh, we've got consensus there, yes. B, tibial fractures in a six-month-old. 50% of physical abuse uh, is in children under the age of one, and it's usually the parent or the mother's boyfriend or significant other or a step-parent. Um, and if the history just doesn't fit with the injury, that's when your spidey senses should get going. There's something called the 10-4 rule, the torso, the ears, the neck, age four, any region uh, of the child under the age of four months. Um, so if you've got a spiral fracture in a child and they're not walking yet, that's concerning. Um, any rib fractures or skull fractures. And then there's injury patterns. So, I mean, if you lift up the shirt and it's like, that looks like John Deere belt buckle, right? I mean, you know, something like that, like some physical form that you look at on the child and stuff like that, burns specifically that are in the shape of cigarette burns and multiple injuries that the child has in different ages of healing. The one time I still remember, I, you know, and you learn from your mistakes, right? And, I, and I'm not sure if it was a mistake, but you can tell me. I, I had a child that came in, and it was like the third fracture they had, or something like that. And so my spidey senses were tingling, and I'm like, what's going on here? You know, under the age of five, they've had three broken bones, and of course, the, um, the mother is a nurse at the hospital, and I'm like, and so, you know, I got children's aid involved, and how do you, how do you get children's services involved when it's a co-worker? And it, it was like, well, you know, and I've got to say, you know, I've got an obligation, and um, I should have looked deeply into that child's eyes. What did they have? Osteogenica imperfecta, and that's how the diagnosis was made by children's services. Um, but now, you know, if I see a pattern like that, I'm making sure I look deeply into that child's eyes, right? And so they got the treatment they needed, and the, the mom, the nurse, was great about it. Sexual abuse, um, uh, yeah, the vast majority are relatives or family members or acquaintances, and usually the victims are female, and that's horrible that we have sexual abuse at all. Children um, who display inappropriate uh, sort of behaviors uh, for their age, you should be suspecting it if they're acting out abusive behavior, um, if they're getting recurrent UTIs. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, you get a child coming in with recurrent, uh, a young girl coming in with recurrent UTIs, it's you've got to take a look and you've got to look for bruising and, and um, trauma in the vaginal area. And certainly if there's mental health associated with it, an underlying cause, that follow-up question is, are you, do you feel safe at home? Is everything all right? Needs to be asked. Um, physical exam is often unremarkable with sexual abuse. Um, screening for STDs or STIs um, is important. And uh, if there is an involvement of a rape, the most uh, rape trips have a 72-hour window for collecting that uh, data. Um, but, I, you know, when this comes up in my jurisdiction, we have a center that we refer these people to that, you know, you don't want me stumbling through it once every three or four years and screwing it up. And so we have a clinic that we can send these um, children to. And then neglect. Neglect does result in more deaths. Uh, it's the most common cause of failure to thrive. And maternal depression can be the cause. So looking for that postpartum depression as well. Consider failure to thrive if they're not on the growth curve um, or they're dropping off the growth curve. I mean, look at the parents, right? If, if you've got this small child and dad's six, six and mom's six feet, you know, it doesn't, have, but if mom's 5'11", or sorry, if mom's 4'11", and dad's 5'2", and you've got a small child, there's concordance there, right? But when things are out of concordance, that, you know, what's the most common cause of FLK? Funny looking kid, FLP, funny looking parent. So, you know, if Johnny doesn't look right, look at, oh yeah, no, I understand, right? 
So, so the same thing happens with, you know, sorry about that, same thing happens with growth and stuff like that. You know, they should look like their parents, right? And if their parents are petite, if their parents are large, that's what you should have as a child. But if they're falling below the fifth percentile or they're flowing off, uh, flowing off, uh, falling off the um, growth curve and stuff like that, be concerned about neglect. Um, diagnostics are not usually required. It's a good history followed by a directed physical exam. Yeah, you can do bone age tests if you're worried about cystic fibrosis, which is the commonest genetic deformity in Caucasians or, uh, or mutation in Caucasians. Um, but the best evidence uh, for neglect is you put that child in a good environment and they thrive and they get back on the growth curve and do well, sort of like an N of one. And uh, you are required, right? This is a reporting requirement that you have. That's it.